Okay, last speaker, uh, probably one of the most important speakers we have today, Leonora Roland. Everybody, most of you know her already, of course, at least all the video fellows know her. She was trained in economic, social, and environmental history at the University of Bern in Switzerland and received her PhD at the Ruhr Universität in Germany in 2014, uh, while, while the research for the project was funded by Fellowship of the famous Institute of Advanced Study and Humanities in Essen, in the KWI. Eleonora right now is professor of uh, for entangled history in the Americas, 16th to 19th century, at the University of Bielefeld. <coughs> um, something happened in between, but I just mentioned the most important thing, Please, yes. and one of the most important things I would say is together with three colleagues from the faculties of physics and biology, so interdisciplinary. Uh, very much on the way, so to speak. I have, uh, she has co-founded the Lecture for Future in Bielefeld, dealing with the Anthropocene and clima, Climate Crisis, which gained some fame, if I may say so. <laughs> for, for a bit, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I just want to mention um, some of her books, because she has also many. Sharing the Risk, Fire, Climate and Dis Disasters, Swiss Re, that's an insurance company, <coughs> 1864 to 1906. <coughs> that were published in Lancaster. Uh, uh, Carnegie Publishing, Crucible Books, Lancaster, 2011. <coughs> Entangled History of the Environment, question mark. Socio-Environmental Transformations in the Caribbean, 1492 to 1800. That is WBT, University of New Orleans Press. Um, 2021, and uh, another very famous book that gave her some fame, if I may say so, uh, Changes of the Year, Hurricanes in New Orleans from 1718 to the present, that's uh, in the series Environmental History, practice fifth, number 15, uh, um, Oxford 2019. floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm um, going to take up the, our, our conceptual uh, topic here a little more um, and I'm going to sort of confront it with another concept that we've also and you have also already discussed. And um, unfortunately, I missed the uh, discussion that happened yesterday evening, apparently already. Um, so entanglement versus momentum of its own um, eigendynamic um, is is the focus, and um, so I'll I'll start maybe by introducing um, why entanglement. Um, I mean, it's maybe kind of obvious for for many um, studying the Americas that the entanglement concept makes sense. Um, I came to the entanglement concept via my uh, professorship here, <laughs> which the, the denomination is Entangled History of the Americas, um, and. Um, so maybe I'll start with definitions, um, because obviously there is a kind of maybe interesting opposition between these two concepts. And I will also maybe say a few words why I'm doing that. It refers back to what I said yesterday in the introduction um, while I was working with France and uh, that research group um, on, on eigendynamic um that was kind of usually the the point the point where discussions got got heated was when I came in with with entanglement and and um, you know but from the perspective and this is the other point that will come in as well of environmental history um, there are some difficulties looking at eigendynamic and so <clears throat> that was uh, yeah always a bit of a, a sort of moments moments of tension but I would say productive and interesting ten tension so I'm going to try and. Um, bring in some of these points that, that were made in these discussions here and maybe some continuing thoughts and then um, maybe we can draw all of your arguments together and have something like a concluding discussion on yeah how, how can we deal with um, entanglement um, and or rather momentum of its own in um, the region of Latin America. We are already in the introduction. So you're seeing a map of Hispaniola in the background, um, and this is because I'm actually going to try and make some examples um, from my own research, which is still very much in its uh, beginnings. So 
I'm not actually even sure how whether I can make meaningful examples. Maybe I'm not going to convince France. I know already, <laughs> but um, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Give it a try. It. Well, yeah, that's what I'm. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm totally exposing myself here. So entanglement, entangled histories. Um, it's a it's a concept. I might quickly um, sort of introduce. I mean, most of you know that it emerged out of this discussion about. Um, comparativism or comparative history and was sort of a, an idea or a, a solution um, uh, sort of <laughs> resolving the problem of holding against each other, usually European uh, nations and uh, then in many cases also um, post-colonial nations or yeah, um, so-called emerging um, economies um, or erstwhile colonies, which never came out equal, of course. So um, uh, post-colonial scholars made, and here Shalini Randeria, an anthropologist, made the suggestion of, well, let's try and look at this issue, uh, or not so much compare, but look at how these um, places or also powers um, were entangled or what the entanglement um, uh, is between um, these these different agents. So this is not a, a verbal quote, but a more sort of a, a, yeah, a summary of, of what I'm reading in what most uh, one of our most recent publications or an interview with her um, in 2019. His, so entanglement are basically histories or entangled histories, histories of colonial contact um, and one could also say not just colonial contact, but almost a kind of co-evolution um, and continued interaction, yeah, um, under conditions of unequal and, or asymmetrical power relations. Um, and so the, I would say the, the interaction and the, the exchange is being um, focused in this concept, mm -hmm. which we might already kind of feel that there could be a tension with momentum of its own. But let's see. So um, now this, uh, all of this discourse, so on comparative history, on entanglement, also the other concepts that were um, suggested in the course of this uh, discourse, this more methodological discourse, if you will, like, um, oh, what were the others? Yeah, connected histories, I think, was another one. And then histoire croisée. And so there is a whole genealogy also of these concepts. You all know this. Um, so, but all of these kind of uh, came out of, of uh, a c cultural history or sort of a historic background that did not include um, environmental history or environmental factors at all, um, which might not be surprising because that's basically what most of the disciplines that have worked around these concepts ha have done. They have looked at society and how society um, evolves uh, minus natural uh, elements. And so based on that perspective and, and kind of my own <laughs> criticism of, of this concept, I wanted to do, and that's basically my, my work program is to bring in environmental aspects into entangled history. So I'm interested in seeing how um, access to land, access to energy, uh, to resources, um, influence these power relations and um, basically kind of co-inform these asymmetrical uh, power situations that we're seeing in colonial um, situations and colonial histories. Um, so this is what I have been suggesting. So a quick, quick advertisement uh, here. <laughs> Not really. Um, this is a very, it's called a long essay or a very short book where I sort of come up with some first ideas in that direction um, and where the idea um, is proposed. So momentum of its own. We have the definition um, on our call for papers a momentum of its own are social processes that can be described as inherently dynamic if they continue to move out of themselves and without further external influence, thereby producing and reproducing a pattern characteristic of them. And I highlighted without further external influence, and you may be able to gauge why, because, and um, again, this sort of refers to the wider tradition of our disciplines as well, nature or the environment has been thought of as being external to society. 
I would question even that, but this is the situation we have. So in this game of, um, yeah, like looking at momentum of its own in uh, Latin American countries, from a perspective of environmental history, that is very difficult to do if we think of the environment as external. So there is my, my first point of difficulty. Um, <clears throat> So and in the call for papers continues. Um, the definition aims at identifying a certain number of relevant processes for a given situation, which together carry a concrete momentum of its own. These processes can be located both inside and outside a geographical or social unit. So far, so clear. The particular are thus the processes to be concretely identified, which are to be determined for each object of investigation, but not the social or geographical spaces. And so, all fine. Um, in our initial discussions, um, when the the three criteria that we have set in this call for papers for, as in like those that we would like to see, whether they reappear in different societies, the problem for me was also to disregard geographical space. Because um, looking at an island in the Caribbean as my sort of research focus, um, it was kind of my, my, my first imp impression, my first impulse was to say, well, okay, so it's an island. And if I think of this as a geographic space, I can very well already just from thinking about it, um, contain that just because it's, it's geographically isolated and especially for the time I look at where communication is extremely slow because it takes about two months to go by ship between the island and the mother country. Um, there, there, I can imagine a lot of momentum of its own happening just by dint of geographical space. Um, at the same time, the whole colonial endeavor is so much interaction, so entanglement, that I find it difficult to say anything about, um, you know, excluding external factors. So a bit what we've seen in different cases today. So, yeah, so that was that was one thought process that I wanted to bring in and then thinking about, and we, I think we also discussed at least briefly uh, Europe or I, and, and I, I think maybe at that point in time, I didn't think in a proper way or the way you did <laughs> about momentum of its own, but I thought, well, how can we, call, how can we think about, you know, excluding external factors in Europe because there is so much movement and migration and interaction going on, like how do we talk about, uh, you know, momentum of its own in, in such a interacting space. Um, but of course, it makes sense in a way or in, in the definition that we've had since and with regard to such sort of large scale societal uh, topics as uh, estate based societies or uh, consensus orientation, etc. So, um, but I'm just going to sort of give you a bit of my, my thought process. So the questions and doubts that um, came up for me um, are really a uh, momentum of its own and entanglement are, as I, I said, uh, concepts that stand in opposition to each other in my feeling or yeah, with regard to their histori historiographical geniality. So what I said, um, entanglement is also a, a, an... A, concept that is meant to to get out of the, the whole modernity discussion um, and um, to sort of uh, criticize that uh, European modernity notion in, in many ways, whereas momentum of its own, as far as I have been able to re retrace it and see it, is still sort of comes out of a, a tradition that is still kind of quite positive about there being a European modernity and a self-propelled sort of European modernity, which is precisely what we were trying to criticize here or to sort of work around in a way. Um, but still, so this is a kind of question. Are they irreconcilable as, as uh, concepts? And then, um, as I said before, there, there are concepts that have been conceived in a long-standing disciplinary tradition, and this is more my own problem as an environment, environmental historian with that nature-culture divide, right? Um, and then 
my question also in in the process of of discussion with the research group was um do, so do i have to decide for one could i not make a productive kind of co use of both of them and um or even claim a sort of you know entanglement and momentum of its own sort of um like waves of both or like ablösungsprozess so we have moments of entanglement and then we have um sort of phases of eigendynamic uh, that that sort of interchange like phase wise um and then what happens if i try to apply these concepts in the case of european contact with the americas and its aftermath so the 15th and 16th century and i would like to give a few examples some of them are extremely macro so the first one broad and you all like i think anyone who's a student of latin america will know this <laughs> so i'm not telling you anything new um <laughs> and um maybe just mentioning the word macro um all, also brings me to a a thought that i had or yeah that we were discussing yesterday a little bit in the evening as well is um that one of the questions i think that that arises from what we've been looking at and discussing so far is really also the level of of change that we're looking at so what level of society are we talking about and um just the three factors um that we gave you are on a very high kind of sort of societal structural level but yeah the question is 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 that are we just interested in sort of very very large scale changes but or are we also interested in sort of more micro level changes um or, and i'm i'm guessing francis answer would be yes if the micro levels sort of inform or influence what the what the sort of these structures or these these concepts are doing yes um and so let's let's see um so yeah but i would like to maybe just bring in the that sort of thinking about um the the different societal levels of change that we're talking about so um yeah my first example 1492 and the famous columbian exchange and um you will excuse my use of a 19th century visual of europe how 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 americans basically imagined columbus arriving on hispaniola so we have this moment um um in which uh, like not just the first voyage but then the second in particular where uh, columbus arrives with animals and with a first load of of people of settlers um that is crucial because it's also when he arrives with pathogens we all know that then um start circulating on the island and that very quickly um spread further and that very quickly um start to depopulate the island not only the pathogens of course we also know there was a huge amount of very violent behavior of the spaniards um with their means with their weapons towards the indigenous population very evidently but um i will for the moment uh, highlight the 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 pathogens and then the other <laughs> natural or elements that we would maybe um sort of order under environment or nature right so animals pathogens plants that were brought from europe and that started what is called the columbian exchange which is huge um i mean that didn't affect uh a state based sort of um standesstrukturen yeah but i would say what it does is apart from what you can see here i'll i'll be focusing for the moment on here so the 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 pathogens by dint of that depopulation by pathogens and by violence we have from them 1530s onwards we have continuous reports from the island saying the island is depopulating very quickly we need more uh um indios that we can enslave to work the gold mines and particularly we need enslaved africans um and quickly and we want to free trade them um so my argument and without it wanting to sound um determinist and of course that danger always arises when you talk about environmental factors playing a role so taking into account all 
other societal issues that happen here. But highlighting this, I would say we have definitely environmental factors that influence the 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 process of of the change in society in the colonies, right? So the import of large scale, uh, like large numbers of of Africans by force, has to do with with this the population situation on the other side of the Atlantic. Um, and that really changes societal structures, even if the Spanish don't you know, throw over Standesgesellschaft. But um, what, what Jorun has told us today about um, Spanish society and African uh, slaves and their behaviors, etc., is ultimately kind of a result of this, of this situation. So, and just quickly, <clears throat> people probably also know um, the slave voyages dot org website and its wonderful maps and this here just shows the extent again of the volume of the whole slave trade so from the first uh, traded africans to 1888 basically so this is like a snapshot of <coughs> slave trading <coughs> era and where ships went and i mean these are super macro large scale <laughs> situations and of course it's kind of a flattening argument to say like this, all of this has like, you know, has to do with um, this, this initial situation. And of course, uh, many other interests and issues play into this. Of course, we have the economic interest, um, et cetera, et cetera. But initially, the situation is, is really like that. And you can see in the sources that the argument is made, depopulation, um, we need more workforce. And since we know that um, the, the Portuguese are doing this already and it's working beautifully for them, we want to have this too. And we want to have enslaved Africans. So that would be my, my, my first super macro example of um, the environment playing a role in, and now it's a question, entanglement and or a momentum of its own. Um, definitely for, for me, this would be an entanglement um, um, argument, obviously, but then if we say we look at eigendynamic at a very sort of high flying level in the sense of evolution of societies structurally, um, racially in quotation marks, um, yeah, that could also be an argument. Um, I have a second example that is also not from my own research, um, but it's closer to home with uh, regard to the research area. Um, which I think is very interesting. Um, so Sherry Johnson is a colleague from uh, F Florida, Florida, Florida University. Some I forget. Anyways, <laughs> one of the I think two or three Floridian universities, um, and she wrote this book, "A Climate and Catastrophe in Cuba and the Atlantic World in the Age of Revolution." And um, the research focuses really on the 1760s and 70s which were very hurricane intense um, decades. Um, and here we get into a bit of environmental and climate history. So bear with me, <laughs> we'll, we'll get out of it again. So you, it's possible to reconstruct um, El Nino events historically. So paleoclimatologists can reconstruct historical El Ninos um, we, there are, uh, it's a bit complicated and I can't, I won't explain all of this here. If you would like to know more, I'm happy to, uh, tell and discuss. So we have reconstructions of, of strong El Ninos back to the 1530s or 40s by now that are taken from, from multi-proxy, um, studies. So that means, <laughs> um, Speleothems, which is uh, Topsteine. Um, I think it's also coral, coral reefs, um, lake sediment, cores, so pollen analysis, and also um, historical records as far as possible. So it's a combination of, of kind of natural data and, and human data that is being combined, combined to do these reconstructions. So they're fairly robust, I would say. Um, and the 1560s and 70s have several such reconstructed El Nino situations. 
Um, and we also know from climatological research that <clears throat> particular La Nina events increase the possibility of hurricanes in the Atlantic and in particular the Caribbean. So this is stuff one has to sort of know <laughs> before going into, into this story. Um, and so following her, her research then in, in the archives, um, she was able to unearth all of these discussions about, you know, hurricanes um, destroying infrastructure, um, roads, cities, etc., many times over in very short succession. Um, and what happens in, in the Caribbean really is because it's so fractured from a colonial history perspective. So you have islands like even like, for example, Hispaniola at that point in time, which is divided between French and Spanish. You have English possessions, you have French possessions. So all of the colonial powers are of very close proximity in this archipelago. And if, if a disaster like this, like a hurricane happens, what usually happens is not, you can't maintain mercantilism in a classic sense. So if an emergency is there, people will start trading with each other for supplies, even if they're technically, in a mercantilist sense, not allowed to. And free trade isn't a reality yet. And what happens over the course of these 20 years, she looks at, is that Spain, which ha who has a, a much stronger and stricter version of mercantilism than, for example, the French, they loosen up and ultimately grant free trade to uh, their, their colonies in, in the Caribbean because of the situation. So that's <clears throat> what she is able to, to retrace in this, in this study, which is really interesting, I would say, and maybe not as macro as an example um, like the one before, but still sort of environmental factors in this region influence policy um, in, a, in a pretty big way. Okay, so passing on to a more micro level and the beginnings of my own research on, on Hispaniola. And um, I might have to explain what I'm trying to do because um, I can't make a sort of long durée argument yet or a sort of big picture argument. So my idea really ultimately is to um, write a social environmental history of that island from um, basically colonial contact to the Haitian Revolution and to see really also maybe a bit in a sense, uh, but not too strongly leaning to, towards um, Sherry Johnson's study, but in a sense to see are there moments in this history where these repeated disasters, because it's, the archipelago is very prone to, like it has volcanic eruptions, it has hurricanes, et cetera, et cetera. So do these co continuously happening uh, extreme events influence how society and, and interacts? Um, are there adaptations, if I'm saying it in quotation marks, or like a, a disaster culture that emerges? Or are there, like after specific events, clear changes again, like in policy or in, in um, agricultural practice, etc. So that's what I would like to see or find. That's the basic question. Um, and yeah, as I said, I, I'm, it's going to be a long term project and I haven't got that far yet. But what I can see or say, I will present a little bit here. So this is from Juan Legajo. Um, all of you students of Latin America know what that means. So you can get very thin piles or you can get very big piles. Um, so Legajo 73 is very big. Um, and it, uh, I got to the end of, I think, the 16th century uh, looking through these uh, records. And so what I can see throughout the 16th century is, again, um, this is well known, um, that from the 1530s onwards, we have these repeated mentions of depopulation, which has nothing to do um, with, like, apart from the pathogens, has not or not only to do with environmental issues, but it's really also because people prefer to go to the, the uh, Tierra Firme um, and to, to Mexico and um, try and, and make their luck there. Because actually Hispaniola didn't turn out as... Uh, um, as promising as first thought. Mm -hmm. um, so these are just 
um, quick quotations from uh, from my records. And then um, again, these repeated requests to freely trade enslaved Africans to make up for this deficit of people who are who are going away. And as as we further progress, the more these uh, these letters. So it's it's the also um, I should say I'm looking at the Cabildo Secular uh, de la Isla de Española. So it's it's the Cabildo of um, Santo Domingo, um, and their reports to the Crown, basically. And um, <clears throat> so the more we progress um, t uh, t through the century, these reports become more pressing um, and more desperate in in many ways and also we have um mentionings almost of of you know the breakdown of the colony because there are not enough people to maintain it also early ish mentionings of the french starting to raid places on the island and they don't have um defenses or enough people to actually defend the island so all kinds of problems that really don't have anything to do with with environment and, and like yeah, per se, but so the, it's also the interplay of these factors that interests me because the environment then at some point sh shows up um, in a very indistinct and undefined but interesting way. So from the 1550s onwards, we have repeated mentions of the difficulty uh, facing the colony um, and this environmental hardship. So toda la isla es da muy fatigada. Uh, que nunca hacemos otra cosa que llorar. So that, I thought that was very endearing um, and just impressive um, sort of, uh, utterance. But obviously, it's also clear that writing to the king and to or the emperor and wanting to attract attention and money, um, you have to sort of maybe also exaggerate um, at some point. Um, Often this is um, in, comes, comes in context with um, reducing the, the taxes, so the, the taint, um, because the, the little population that is there cannot trade because not enough ships are coming to the island. And then we have this environmental hardship, so they cannot really grow crops and they cannot really sort of pay their taxes in any way, neither could they do this in species, nor could they do it in, in naturals, in, in a sense. So these reports of hardship go hand in hand with pleas for reducing or relieving them of, of the, the, the Um And then again, uh, towards the 1570s, we have again continued these um, notions of the, the sick earth or sterile earth, and so it's it's for, for me, I have done a lot of research in the 18th century where we have a very clear language about, you know, climate, environment and, and climat climatic issues. It's very close to what we are using today. But in this time, um, uh, this it's very indistinct, but I have to infer that something's happening, but I don't know what. Like, what does it mean? It's like, is there a drought? Uh, what does you know, sterile and sick mean right so i can only guess that something is going on um yeah and so <laughs> that's basically where i'm at um and wh where in my case with environmental and climate history the interdisciplinarity and the paleoclimatologists that i mentioned come in again because that would be sort of another way of bolstering the hypothesis something environmental is happening here on a larger scale, and maybe that is, you know, influencing society, and maybe also, and I haven't gotten as far as to be able to say, well, there is change happening on the policy level, and it has to do with those mentionings. So, as I said, very <laughs> inconclusive, and probably not convincing France, because I can't say hurricanes changed Standesgesellschaft. Um, so there we are. <laughs> Um, that is just a little teaser of what I'm trying to do and maybe why to sort of make clear why the question of, you know, external factors mustn't play a role is difficult for that perspective because it's, it's, like, it's exactly what I want to look at if we're looking at external like nature or environment as external to human society. So, um, and I think that was my conclusion already, kind of. And um, thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Probably a lot of questions, I presume. I don't know. <laughs>
Too much. Yeah, just uh, just just a comment actually. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think it, it's definitely worthwhile to uh, think of environmental factors in this whole setting of uh, momentum of its own, etc. However, I wouldn't agree with you when you say that it's a decision either environmental factors or uh, momentum of its own or eigendynamic. And I, I just want to give you an example from the European context. The witch crazes and witch hunts. We know now that uh, there is a coincidence between uh, environmental factors uh, related to the, um, what is it in English, small ice age, little, little ice age, little ice age yeah. kleine ice side, yeah. and uh, the peaks of these witch hunts. However, I would argue if we look at witch hunts, we can observe what we may call momentum of its own, because uh, once uh, a witch craze started, you can observe similar mechanisms, similar dynamics and yeah so I, I think this is not a contradiction mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but um, thank you for that example <laughs> yeah. yeah I don't know whether this can be applied on uh, the Hispaniola problem or... you've raised yeah. now Hispaniola and this mm -hmm. uh, issue of, of uh, um, uh, well I don't know um, depopulation of course and and, and uh, malas cosechas um, yeah. Maybe not specifically that, but yeah. Um, I mean, I I can I can uh, maybe briefly add uh, another um, very micro 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 <laughs> um, perspective that I I've worked on and that is also a sort of first case study in the in the long essay, um, where I'm looking at the the um, the royal chroniclers or like the the early chroniclers. And how they talk about um, Columbus's landing and what happens, because we have mentions of a famine, and um, for, I think it's ninety five and six or ninety four to ninety six. So it comes up several times, um, and the argument is, oh, it's the indigenous population hiding food from the Spaniards. The indigenous use this as a as a strategy to starve out the Spaniards. They want to sort of get rid of us. Which makes sense in a sort of guilt uh, kind of uh, situation because that's already when the Spanish have had violent interaction on the island and the indigenous population actually killed Columbus's first group of people who he left there. So it, it would make sense from that point of view, but because there are other elements in that um, in these in these mentionings and in these sources where I also. And this is all very, very hypothetical, but where I would say, hmm, there are mentionings of environmental factors where I would say, drawing on other research I did and drawing on research colleagues did, um, it's, it's possible that actually this could be a an, an climatic extreme that prevents the indigenous population from giving food, from producing excess food that they can give to 1,500 Spaniards that suddenly show up at their door. <laughs> um, and also because the sources mention not only the, the, the Spanish dying, but also the indigenous population dying in that famine. Mm. So, and my, my, my hypothesis was, well, this, because the Spanish don't know what, a normal, what the normal climate in this area is, they can't say, oh, it's a drought or, you know, something extreme or weird is happening. And that's why we're not getting food. But the only sort of way of explaining this situation is using a trope they know from Europe. That's also, we have all of these ideas of the, um, the corn jude or um, merchants hoarding corn, etc. So that's almost, so I was just wondering, is this kind of, you know, and that would also be, very long-winded answer, an example of, of, of eigendynamic or of transporting kind of these forms or experiences from your home place to a new place um, for lack of other explanations. And that kind of, yeah, reproducing patterns, but I'm not sure whether that would account for eigendynamic. So, yeah, I try. Um... If I understood right, you're mostly preoccupied about this thing 
that eigen that momentum does not have external factors influences and I think it depends on the definition you take even in the global except you sent us there were different um, different definitions according to which uh, sociologist was talking mm -hmm. so, um, I thought about this too about this no inter external mm -hmm. influences and then I just chose the other definition <laughs> 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 that okay um, of course there are always external factors you, we are not working here in, yeah. in, in physical Close experiments or whatever. Of, yeah. we are historians so there is always the context we cannot draw it out and we cannot manage it and um, so I thought I, I've never doubted that of course there are and I, I even <coughs> mentioned a lot my, my, my what I presented mm. was much more complex than just a single I mean, a single momentum without yeah. external influences. I mean, yeah. I had the public sphere and I had the actors. And Africa, <laughs> as in like African sort of. The yeah. So um, I think, well, it depends on the working group. And apparently, Kant uh, Allinghaus has a very uh, dominant role. Or, or I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, wasn't, it wasn't only him. It wasn't only him. I have to. I have to yeah, relieve him. Yeah. No, no, no. It wasn't. It wasn't only him. Like we, it's a, some discussions revolved around this quite but, a bit. But I have the yeah. idea that if you just switch to another definition, what you were presenting as now is not a problem. <clears throat> I think that's not a problem. I also have my problems with um, momentum, but I think it's more this magic issue that it's you somehow can use it to explain something where you don't have an explanation, and I'm not sure if this is an explanation. If, if you not just say, okay, here, that's how I try to use it, in fact, it doesn't didn't work. So um, I don't know, that's my problem with, with the momentum, but not the external factor thing. Okay, <laughs> so yeah, I think we should we should probably sort of you have to answer to that. Come on, <laughs> that's a, that's a real sort of. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think actually, thank you very much for taking up the definition and then you know looking at it from your perspective. That, that was really brilliant. Uh, uh, I, I really enjoyed enjoyed listening to you um, because, in my view, seventy five percent of of your critics is. Uh, due to we didn't really explain what we meant, for instance, by what is external. And yeah. external mm. is not external to to a geographic region or whatsoever, external to the process as such. Mm -hmm. So it's an abstract external, so to speak. That is the question. So we have a, a momentum of its own as a process, mm -hmm. and this process feeds from itself. But so, not just from itself. That's what one of the, the people on the um, side say, also from itself, but with other, and you can always stop it and so on. So this... Uh, well, that's difficult. I mean, okay, we, we stick to one, that's like, like, it happens quite often, especially even though with, with entanglement, there are many, def uh, <clears throat> many oh, yeah. um, uh, definitions out. So we stick to a close, not because we are so orthodox, but if you, if you get a, a definition let's say, right to the point, um, and, <clears throat> and that produces a lot of counter-arguments like yours here, that may be fruit fruitful for, for going one step further. I mean, two years from now, maybe uh, our conception, uh, how we conceptualize um, uh, self-aware processes, and maybe entanglement, will be different from now if we get a strict definition right, because then it is easier to challenge that definition and reformulate it. So our idea would be, <clears throat> that external to the process, not to any geographical region, any mm. whatsoever, to the process influences. Um, so, so if there is something else you have to add, like, let's say, I don't know, a certain, like, like for instance, one, one of the examples in, in Nettleman's uh, mind is bureaucracy. <clears throat> and this uh, bureaucracy obviously uh, runs for itself, so to speak. You have a formula and then make you, you you detect that not all the things you want to you want to question the people is in there, so the formula gets longer and longer. And then there's a reform because everybody says, okay, this is, this formula is too long. And even the reform is part of the of the momentum of its own because it starts again. 
if you have something external you need to foster that process, for instance, I cannot, I cannot think of something external that would have to be have to be implemented as a driving force for bureaucracy. My my fantasy lacks here. Mm, yeah, bureaucracy you, is not. Let's not geared towards some, some girls sitting <laughs> on the shoulder of uh, on the so, uh, shoulder of of all the bureaucrats uh, in in the administration that says go on or or that or you can imagine. Uh, you can say, well, this is not due to momentum of its own, but to the mentality of the bureaucrats, of the, the uh, administrative um, personnel in an administration. That would be external to uh, that would be an external moment to this process just result, and I'm sticking it to minds and animal. Mm -hmm. So, if you need a, a certain mentality as a driving force for getting more, um, uh, more, more. Um, formulas out, mm -hmm. uh, then that would, at a certain moment, otherwise it would stop, then momentum of it all, at that point, is dead. Mm -hmm. So okay. external is not, yeah, please. I mean, just uh, my answer to that uh, example, I think there is a very um, important right. external yeah. factor to, for bureaucracy to be self-reproducing, and that is, um, it needs to be financed. So there needs to be a, a population which pays taxes. We so, all have to breathe, we all have to eat. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> There's always so external the factors. Yes. If the government changes, <clears throat> this kind of bureaucracy can just stop because the, the governor says we are not going to to invest in, I don't know what, uh, fuel fossils. So the whole department is stopped. Right. So you so need... So far it didn't happen. <laughs> you need, what you need is a permanent financiation, a permanent, you need much more factors for bureaucracy. That's, that's why but I... But it doesn't, that there are people sitting there who have to eat, breathe and drink. You need those people. If they, like in Hispaniola, die away, you don't have any bureaucracy. But does it explain bureaucracy? I mean, th there's always some, ba you can always... Uh, I think uh, you need the government. Okay, that's a good point. But that's a good point. If you think that uh, financing the administration is the decisive point that bureaucracy takes on a momentum of its own, then it, that is an external factor. Um, but as far as I can see, um, the money for the last 20 decades is always there for bureaucracy and it's the momentum of its own that I'm not an expert in administration. But the only distinct distinction I would make is um, the momentum of its own as a momentum of its own always feeds on something. But that doesn't, I mean, that there are people, as I said, people sitting there and eating and drinking that is prerequisite to to somebody, you know, collecting all these, uh, these files and, and, and sending out letters. Uh, that doesn't explain the momentum of its own. There's always some base basis here, but that doesn't explain it. That brings me to to your environmental point. Um, my imagination, and that was a good example, your, your witch hunt in the Little Ice Age. Uh, my imagination, the, my, my critic here is, there's no doubt <coughs> that, um, uh, especially in, in, the, in the culture, in a, in a society that feeds on, that doesn't have an industry, that lacks on transportation we know right now, and that um, 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 is more or less an agricultural society. Climate is an important factor. Hurricanes is it an totally important factor. It totally is. I mean, also in Europe. No, nope. Right? I mean, we're not just talking here colonial society, we're talking European society throughout the early modernity. Well, yeah, but that's not in the definition of, of Renderia you cited here, because you need colonial contact, and within... Uh, uh, Amsterdam and Nuremberg, there are a lot of contacts which influence each other, and that would be not part of the definition here. Um, so it's contact at all, and then if you take contact, contact, well, yeah, right, there's always contact. I, yeah, I, wasn't, I, wasn't, I wasn't now so much talking about entanglement, sorry, I was just more reacting to, your, um, to, you, to what you said about uh, the importance of, of environmental or climatic factors for colonial and like early modern, I would say early modern societies in general, because yeah. Completely right. Don't have to. No, no disagreement. No disagreement. <laughs> yeah. disagreement. Yeah. What? No, uh, the, the only disagreement here is, um, as you said, if, if we get a little of Ice Age or the contrary of that, will we have to reach out in 2050? Maybe, maybe not. The, 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 
what strikes me is that those people like us who work on culture and cultural history and, and society, they always draw a direct line from a, a thing in nature to the effects. But we all know that there's something in between. Uh, society, culture has to interpret what happens. That's and what one interpretation is witch hunt. Another interpretation could be we ignore it. Another interpretation, we have, first of all, we have to detect it as a problem. And, and that, we, that, that really changes throughout um, history of, of knowledge, of course, and of science, um, how you interpret it. Like, right. That's, that I mean, really, the, the I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I would like to sort of maybe um, weaken what you were saying a little bit. Um, a lot of environmental and climate historians know exactly that and do not draw you know, direct lines from sort of, you know, hurricane and then sort of blah, 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 something happens and bang, that's causality and there we have it. But so just, if that was it. I think so, because you, you said there was depopulation and then uh, slave market. I also said there are other factors that influence this I whole situation. I don't speak of other okay. factors now. I'm speaking okay. of interpretation of what happened <clears throat> by the given culture. I mean, the famous factor, if you do take a present, present day example, is when uh, um, this power plant in Eastern Europe blew up. In Germany, there was a big debate, and we dropped out of uh, um, nuclear energy. In France, there was no debate. That is almost a political issue, but if you take the famous example of, I think it's the earthquake of Lisbon, you're more familiar with that than I am, where at the first time where the debate was like, um, okay, that was the old saying, uh, punishment of God, because this was a sinful city, you didn't stick to the rules, and then somebody pop up, hey, moment, <coughs> just a moment, all the Brussels there were safe because they were built on a rock, and all the churches fell down, so why, how can that be... Uh, That's uh, almost always the case at, at, after a certain point in time in, in, in early modern Europe as well. You, ha you have coincidence of both of the sort of act of God kind of argument as well as observing natural phenomena. What, what I'm just trying to say mm -hmm. is that, um, um, at, at least I understood your talk that way, the direct cause of a societal or cultural reaction to, to a disaster is in a way, in my way, misleading because it overlooks the very important factor of interpreting, as first of all, detecting it as a, as a, as a problem, as a cause. For instance, with, with the witch hunt in the Ice Age, the people didn't, were not even aware that they were witch hunting because it was getting colder. So, so mm, that, very aware of it getting colder, even in a sort of... In yeah, a but the link sense. is made by us. No, we have contemporaries who are talking about this. Okay. Renbad Cizat. I'm, I'm, I'd love to give you all the, so the, the documentation. It's, they say it's getting colder, but the, the link between Little Ice Age, the effects of Little Ice Age, and witch hunts is a link that we draw, the contemporaries didn't. So that's, in that, this is where it gets very difficult with causality, and we're getting probably into a very different discussion from the one we're sort of initially we're having, but I, I try to make this short. Um, so obviously Little Ice Age is a modern concept that we're reapplying to the past, mm -hmm. but contemporaries at that point in time did realize something strange is going on, yeah, yeah. and we're actually talking about this. There are several sources that do this. Then... It's very important, and this is a point that also um, our, our uh, dear colleague um, uh, um, Beringer um, does, I think, overlook a little bit. Witch hunts, and you have to really look into the cases, into the court cases. It only works to make that connection and say witch hunts and witches were accused of, of making weather if you actually have that accusation. And you have a lot of witch hunting, which is still going on, not for Betazawa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you want to make cases and say what, what is happening, you have to differentiate there as well. So, Sorry, but, but, no, but that's, a, that's a, it's an important point, yeah, it's, which is usually kind of, you know, it's sometimes also by, by climate historians is flattened out. So I just want to make that, that differentiation. But we can agree on that they didn't burn witches to make the climate warmer again. No, 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 of course not. They, but they burned witches in some cases because of neighborhood uh, quarrels, etc., etc. And then there were these cases where it was said, um, you had a hail event or something, and then it was said, it's these women or men um, who were doing this. Doing and making the weather. Like they were yeah, they, they're doing weather, Wetterzauber, and that's when they were born. So there is a, were burned. So there, you, the, 
So what's that is not, sorry, but that's perfectly what I just said. Okay. It's an interpretation, a cultural interpretation of a natural phenomenon. And I pretty much would, I don't know how the development will go on with our discourse, it's a bit strange right now, but at least for 23, I would argue that what any kind of weather we have, nobody would say that some people here in this room uh, made this weather. So of, the, course. The, no, of course. But uh, yeah, apart, from, apart from anthropogenic climate change, where, where we are doing it now. <laughs> <laughs> nobody, so far, nobody gets burned for that. Yeah, so, yes. so, so, <laughs> Fortunately. Yes. So the direct link of, of people, of, of, I mean, the, the very phenomenon of which influencing the weather is a cultural I mean, the, the only point here is that you cannot draw a direct line between the core, between a natural phenomenon, whatever that may be, mm -hmm. and the uh, the interpretation of society of that phenomenon. That's, and precisely the, oh, yeah. the better thing is, uh, even if the witches uh, burned because people thought that the witches changed the weather, that's their interpretation of a, of a problem. There, uh, yeah, I'm with you. So, but okay. I, yeah, so, oh, so, yeah, okay. And with that, if we have solved that problem, so to speak, then the lines drawn between whatever effect uh, uh, a certain catastrophe has, we have uh, to to build in here the interpretation of the given society. I'm, I'm totally with you yeah. on that. We cannot do this without. And then I'm with, just one okay. sentence, and then, I'm, uh, okay. <laughs> then I would like to cite you, um, hierarchical society didn't change, which is explainable. If all these disasters, if all these slave trade, if all these things happen, why did it not change? And how how robust is this is this concept that even in, in, in South American societies, when we had this example, new groups pop up, new 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 colors of new skin colors pop up, and they find a solution. We don't like that solution, but but the way the, the strong way to interpret even these irritations is something to be that has to be explained. And then the society changes, of course. It changes all the time. It's a new society in South America and Central America, no, no, no doubt about that. But within the framework of pre-modern society, and that is my last button when I'm silent, because... No, no, you're right. fine. <laughs> you're fine. And, is, and the, 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 um, I think the only difference, the only real difference, if we agree on that um, uh, in, our environmental phenomenon had, have to be interpreted by societies. They are, yes. yes. And, and as historians, we have to take this into account, obviously. Well, we first of all have to take this to, inter to take this into account, and that first of all they have to be detected, and then detected, and then they have to be interpreted. Uh, and the interpretation, of course, uh, depends from reason to reason, differs, and it differs from time to time. Exactly. And if we if we do that, then actually I misunderstood at least some of your examples because. In my reading, there you kind of draw a direct line between the causes and the effects. So the interplay, like with witch hunt, is for me very important. And the second point here is that comes into play is the difference between the pre-modern and the modern. And I think there, at least, is, is really a, uh, a big deal because if the um, if the definition here is interaction of uh, uh, of um, entanglement, <clears throat> there's always interaction, but after the emergence of the nation state, I mean, the last paper we, we just heard, after the emergence of citizenship as a concept, this is something completely, in my view, is completely new, and there's a new interpretation of environmental challenges, there's a new concept of nature, I would say, and there's a new concept of, of, of diseases, for instance. So. Even if you look at, at uh, the connection between um, these causes, these, these driving forces here, and the, um, and the consequences a culture draws from what happens uh, in between Earth and heaven and Earth, so to speak, uh, then I would say there's a big distinction between pre-modern and modern times. Uh, and that holds also for, for a momentum of its own. Yes and no. Thank you for that for, for, for that comment. Um, I mean, we even with Hurricane Katrina, we had people who were saying this is a, a Strafe Gottes. So um, for for the people in in Orleans. So I mean, there is, it's always a layering. And I mean, this is also something that that I would like to again stress throughout because there is this, this kind of simplest simplest simplifying perspective 
usually of colleagues from modern history who's like, oh yeah, yeah, in, in early modern or like medieval times, it was all sort of um, sort of punishment from God, and then suddenly comes the Enlightenment, and we have natural uh, kind of causes as as the explanation, and that's not how it works. So we, we have we have um, very early on a layering of of these two. If you're talking about, we have to look at interpretations of these events by the actors. I'm totally with you on that. But then we have to look at all of them. And it's really interesting to see. We have definitely groups or yeah, one one explanation is is very much, you know, act of God. We did this, we did not do that. Um we should, you know, have a, a procession, etc. And then we have uh, obviously, I mean, many, many things are known. If you live in the Alps, you know, kind of you observe nature and you see where the snow is and what avalanches, like the danger of this. The same with rivers and floods. So people know this from kind of pretty early on. So to this is, and, and they will also speak about this in the sources. And so we have a, a co coincidence of these two explanations from a very early time on. That's just one one thing I would like to say, and maybe what what you um, probably experience as me opposing you is what I, what I I'm trying to sort of stave away a little bit is um, the impression that environmental history or what I'm doing is is determinist because I'm 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 pretty convinced that I'm trying to do it in a non determinist way, um, but we can I'm happy to discuss it. Maybe it doesn't come across in a short presentation like this where I was trying to show or highlight the environmental bits um, more than maybe the others. Um, yeah, but that's, that's an important issue for me as well to not sort of, you know, to jump to <coughs> causality and conclusions that do not work. Uh, to pin it down, uh, the difference... Sorry. <laughs> I think we just keep talking, <laughs> uh, maybe we can open the discussion for... Uh... Please, I'm sorry. <laughs> I want to be talking. We, we'll go for coffee again. Yeah. Well, this is a question actually, well, not so much related to your talk, but in general to, to this concept of momentum of its own. I mean, the starting point was, uh, well, these uh, analysis, the texts we read... Um, We've read, um, um, which uh, actually um, explain this concept looking at modern societies. Uh, if I got this right, according to Knöbel, uh, momentum of its own is a typical feature of Western modern societies. So your clue is, no, she's wrong. It's something, a characteristic feature of pre-modern societies, <laughs> actually. Yeah. So what about momentum of its own after 1800? Uh, does it disappear? What, what do you make out of it? I mean, these examples are, are very um, plausible. I mean, terrorism, for instance, or what we uh, all uh, sadly can observe now in, in, in Israel. Uh, I mean, I, I, there I can see processes that uh, definitely have, have some kind of eigendynamic. Yeah, this is my question. I mean, uh, well, well, we what, what press, are there no 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 momentum? Is there no momentum of its own anymore in in modern societies, or how do you solve that problem? There, there is not a problem because we never said that. We okay, yeah, then stupid. just we just would, explain it to yeah, me. We, we would be very stupid if we, we would say that yeah. there is no momentum of its own in, in modern society. To the contrary, the only thing that we're saying is. Uh -huh. um, and Mainz and Erdogan say, well, we, we get, but they are, they are a little bit shy about this. We guess that it is a preferable phenomenon of, of modern societies, but there may be, and they even give one example, mm -hmm. Königsmechanismus, I don't know how that is in English from... from uh, yeah, yeah, English, English, yes, and, yeah, yeah. Um, which maybe is not a good example, but, but they say that maybe even the case in pre-modern times sure, would be, yeah. we, we consider, since we are sociologists, that is my reading, uh, first of all, it's a phenomenon of modern times. Mm -hmm. And of mm -hmm. course it's a phenomenon of modern times. It's always there. And we don't even uh, suggest that uh, it is more prominent in pre-modern times than in modern times. The only thing we, we are saying is if you if we try to historicize it, uh -huh. then you find it also in pre-modern times and in, in many cases, uh, in many places. That's the only that's the only thing we're saying. And uh, your example right now with the with, with the war um, 
uh, in Palestine and in Israel is a like war is the classic thing of mm. eigendynamic of momentum of its own because you know every we see it in Ukraine we see that this is getting worse from day to day so in my reading at least so no that there's no contradiction here um, to, to to pin it down um, what you just said the, the question is is there a driving is a driving force in the occurrence of a certain phenomenon in nature, be it a hurricane or a drought or whatsoever, or a flood, or is a momentum of the interpret, uh, or is mm, the, the, interpretation. the interpretation of the moment? Mm -hmm. So that, that is the basic question. Both. And then the question is, how is that interpreted to a given time? Maybe we disagree here. But this is how, how my, my dear colleagues are sort of constructing the environment out of the story again, which I, I usually oppose a little bit, because what you're saying basically is it's it's uh, the, what what makes it interesting um, or what what makes the momentum would be the interpretation yeah. um, and not the actual event. Right. That's what I'm saying. Where I would say... But that's what you just said. Mm. You just. I, I, I do. I do. I do agree that that this is definitely important. But at the same time, I don't think you can reduce these situations to just the that yeah. interpretation. <laughs> but it's, it's a different story that really I think um, pertains to to uh, yeah to to these yeah the environmental history perspective per se maybe. Um, but maybe one thing. Um, oh yeah, here. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> like, talking to ourselves. Um, yeah, so for me, uh, basically, I had uh, one thing or more point for, for your really interesting talk and also something <laughs> maybe more about this, this general discussions. Um, so for the for the talk, and I think, yeah, it goes, it goes actually good, a bit, sorry, a bit back to um, uh, early on, uh, Thomas was also asking here about your examples on, on food, on, on famine, and uh, so on and for me this was also this was really interesting and I'm for example I'm also really yeah currently I'm working on this on, on food transfer between, mm. between Americas and Europe mm. so um, so that caught my attention and it just to add, to add maybe a thing on that is this uh, in your example it was also about this I think these wafers yeah or the wheat uh, mm. oblata yeah the yeah. Kind of wafer yeah, um, yeah this, I mean, of course, then this huge importance of, of wheat in the yes. in the ritual context. oil wine mm -hmm. and the fact that we brought over yeah, the wine yeah. of course it's very yeah. early on and I mean I've seen that also for example with the with the Philippines here yeah, and some, mm. some documents on that and the priests were saying okay we we need more wheat for that yeah not so much about any other reasons or with another also a colleague who. Talking about that for the Islas Marianas as well. It's, it's, it's actually an example that I would wanted to bring in as well. Um, so <laughs> another <laughs> another example for you. <laughs> so well, that's the last one. Like and then afterwards, everybody has to go and eat something. Um, so um, and this is this is really the the, the wonderful full topic of, of food history there coming in, which is sort of part of environmental history. So one of the uh, really really difficult initial problems coming to the Americas and coming in, into the tropics is how can we grow wheat in order to make bread to, to, to celebrate mass? How can we grow wine? You can't in, on Hispaniola and, and um, olive trees for oil. Um, and so it's, um, it's very clear. And then I think yeah, I had the example there. Um, if the Spanish don't deliver flour, and this is crazy if you think about just the transport and how this, the whole practicality and materiality of this. So the Spanish transport flour to Hispaniola for them to make bread and be able to, to be Christians and do mass. And this is at the core of obviously European society. I don't have to tell you that. <laughs> um, and, and not being able to celebrate mass is a huge issue, right? Because you don't have these, these elements present. Um, and it happens like every whatever. So, like if, if you have a hurricane and your ship sinks and you don't get the flour, what do you do? You have to take maize and do maize bread. Is it as good or is it the, the proper bread for, for, for mass? Right. And so and then on on the basis of this, just to sort of make a little circle, um, you get a sort of new kind of uh, feeding economy in the Caribbean and um, the southern uh, United States, where Europeans have places, corn belts, where they plant wheat in order not to have to transport it from Europe 
to wherever in America, um, and new kind of economic circles. And I would call that entanglement and dynamic of its own, in a certain sense, at the same time, or in a, in a, in a switch. And it has very much to do with maintaining a structure, if you will, mm. yeah, being able to be Christian and right. celebrate Mass. Right. But we, we just discussed ambiguity here, and we know that all these societies are quite flexible in terms of a people that belongs to group A or to group B. Sometimes he just has to change his dress, and then he's, he's Indio or not Indio anymore. Mm. So if they stick to the rule that it has to be wheat grown in a specific way, for me, that's an interpretation. Uh, and if they stick to that, I wouldn't draw a line to they cannot grow it in Cuba. And you see here that the environment uh, has causes a direct effect on how they interpret mass and how they they could have been flexible. Um, uh, how, like uh, if they are fle they are very flexible in, in other circumstances. If they did not, it's their culture uh, to interpret that. So again, we, we, we make a circle here. Way. Again, yeah, maybe. I don't know. again, the driving force here is the interpretation of a lack of uh, uh, certain flowers, uh, certain 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 ingredients, and not the lack of ingredients as such. Usually, people are very flexible. Even Christians are, Christ especially Catholic Christians, are very flexible in, in terms so, of so, different things. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, of course, they don't change their belief or they don't change their yeah. their recipes for making hosts. Yeah. Um, in that sense, it, that all remains um, what it is. But it, it, the, the fact that it gets questioned and, and shaken quite a bit, and several mm -hmm. times, like, mm -hmm. there are phases of this. Irritation. Uh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. large scale. Yeah. So, and then environments and processes and transport structures, etc., um, are change and changing. And obviously, and I'm guessing this is, that's where I'm interested in, a, in a, and that's why I'm talking about levels. Mm -hmm. I'm probably interested in a different level of change than mm -hmm. you are. And I think it already starts with having these three concepts that, that really kind of limit the focus of what you're interested in looking at. Mm. Um, right? And I would still say what the changes I see are, are pretty big and sort of, you know, are irritating and shaking society and are changing it in certain ways, but maybe not these specific stru structures. Well, so maybe that's where... You have one specific structure, if I got it right. And it is, the, the, <laughs> let us pinpoint down the, the differences. And I love this discu discussion. <laughs> but we'll have to stop the, it at some point. <laughs> the one, one thing, the, so, so the People question would be, home. is the driving so force the implementation of, uh, of, an, of, a, of a disease or of, of, uh, of a catastrophe or environment, or is it as an environmental uh, thing as such or something in between? And the, just one last point you mentioned, uh, that even today people interpret um, catastrophes as punishment of God. Yes, they do. There are all kinds of people around. But the question here would be, is that, do we have to um, um, put that not in a, in a wider environment where most of the people don't? And then you have some people like the English or whatever, some people do. So is, is that not an anti-modern movement to stick to, which is an old... Uh, argument, but again, the environment, in this time, the, the cultural environment, I would say, would be relevant for, for reading this interpretation of natural phenomena. But, but there were other Sarah, questions, right? Just, uh, just a very small uh, comment. I, I did not want to leave the impression that everything was flexible and everybody could change uh, categorizations <laughs> just by changing one's clothes. That's Don't just change. a small yeah, comment no, that no. there were limits and it was not so easy. <laughs> right, but, but there were at least... But the question was, of course, is, is would there have been space to do it other, uh, in another way? Is, it, is, there, <clears throat> is there an exclamation mark, sozusagen, an Ausrufezeichen, and an exclamation mark behind, we don't have the right ingredients for, for celebrating the Mass, and that is a big problem. In my view, that's, that's a certain interpretation, and it's not determined by the fact that they don't have this this. this Corn is not the right word, wheat, right? Okay. You have the last word because you... Do I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <of course. laughs> um, so I don't want this, to dominate. These are basically the kinds of discussions we've been having. So you had a little sort of <laughs> taste of that. And um, yeah, so uh, thanks for, for, um, for all of your presentations and inputs. And um, we'll continue having coffee together. <laughs> yeah, thank you for your brilliant talk. <laughs> <laughs>
another question. Yeah, I just one comment. I think that there is something similar. I don't know uh, with the, the uh, planting of tobacco in the Virginia mm -hmm. coast and uh, and taking chocolate. I mean cacao mm -hmm. to uh, either from Venezuela or Guayaquil or Mexico to some areas of Africa. I mean, yeah. uh, what it uh, looking at this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And right now in Mexico with um, avocado trees, mm -hmm. they are being planted everywhere and berries. Yeah. And, and successfully exported. 